Uh, uh, I just came today that we actually share the same hometown, Ithaca, New York, and went to the same high school. Uh, <laughs> Sarah uh, started out at Cornell working with television media uh, before uh, starting a PhD at Colorado State with uh, Chris Plunk, who is actually our student by the speakers in the spring. Um, <laughs> and uh, following that, she uh, started a postdoc with Jeff Connor and uh, Gary Middlebach at uh, Kellogg Biological Station, uh, which is part of NSU. Uh, where Sarah is actually a professor now. And I think Sarah's been at the forefront of some really exciting research, uh, applying genomics to conservation and thinking about how evolutionary forces uh, play out in small populations and what they mean for conservation. And so we're uh, really excited to have you here today. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, David, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this visit for a long time, so glad we could make it happen and really excited to be here and interacting with you all today. As you are all aware, uh, we're in the midst of this really staggering biodiversity crisis, which is demonstrably not an exaggeration to call a social and ecological emergency. And although much of the focus in quantifying this crisis has been on species extinctions, the loss of a species begins and ends with the loss of its populations. So each one of these 63 species depicted in this painting by Isabella Kirkland became extinct after human colonization of the new world. And each one of these 63 species has its own path that led to its extinction. Each one had distinct populations that were becoming small and blinking out before the entire species was lost. So at the really sort of broadest level, my lab's research mission is to contribute to species conservation through basic and applied study of small population evolution and ecology. We tend to do this by thinking about these small population problems that contribute to their vulnerability and how to remedy these problems to promote population growth and um, ensure long-term persistence. And so we integrate field studies, uh, experiments and molecular approaches to address our questions. And we work on a variety of mostly vertebrate systems, including both model and non-model organisms. And since uh, starting my position at MSU in 2017, I've been incredibly fortunate to work with this amazingly talented group of people in my lab um, who I wanted to thank up front. And although I won't get a chance to highlight all of their work today, much of what I'll talk about has been done, has been influenced by and done in collaboration with many of these folks. So this big picture problem motivating our work has actually been highlighted by these two recent science papers this one published just a few weeks ago, estimating global patterns of the loss of genetic variation due to human activities and climate change. And this one published last year, um, highlighting the importance of that variation for individual fitness and for populations to survive and ultimately adapt to these changing conditions. So these combined factors of increasingly fragmented natural landscapes and increasingly stressful and changing conditions means that populations are both losing their genetic variation even faster, but potentially needing it even more. One possible solution to this problem is to maintain or restore connectivity and gene flow among populations. And this gets us to this idea of genetic rescue, which has been become a, a central theme of uh, research in my lab. So what do I mean by genetic rescue? Um, this is an increase in population growth due to the immigration of new alleles or gene flow. Using this definition, genetic rescue is a form of evolutionary rescue in that it's characterized by this sort of classic U-shaped curve in population size where a population is declining, but then before it reaches some extinction threshold, gene flow is the evolutionary force that reverses this decline. And so genetic rescue, you know, the idea can be fairly simply described here, um, but each aspect of this process contains its own set of challenges and questions. So for example, these initial population declines can be caused by extrinsic factors like habitat loss or environmental change, or factors that are more intrinsic to the organism, things like inbreeding depression, 
or an inability to tolerate stress. Declining populations face varying problems associated with being small and can get caught in that positive feedback loop known as the extinction vortex, where strong genetic drift and inbreeding result in the loss of genetic variation. This in turn limits adaptive potential and all of these factors contribute to the stochastic vulnerability of small populations. The extent to which gene flow can rescue these declining populations crucially depends on where that gene flow is coming from, as well as how much and how fast. We know that in some cases, gene flow can cause really negative fitness consequences known as outbreeding oppression. And all of these factors combined can contribute to the outcomes of rescue or lack thereof, and can impact the duration and patterns of fitness effects and be caused by a range of different underlying genetic mechanisms. Of the small handful of uh, sort of iconic examples of genetic rescue in wild populations, most show these similar patterns of initially small or declining populations that then increase following the onset of gene flow shown by the pink arrows here. But many of these early case studies were observational studies, unreplicated, and we typically don't know what's going on, on under the hood of these demographic expansions. Knowing this could be really crucial though, as we learned from the wolves on Isle Royal and Lake Superior, where a single male migrant into that population did cause this initial rescue effect, but then that single male migrant was so successful that soon the entire population became a descendant of that one male wolf and really exacerbated inbreeding and sort of fast-tracked the extinction vortex. And that population did become extirpated before reintroduction of new wolves. And then finally, I think the natural history of these species and their landscapes plays a really huge role in predicting the outcome. So the mating system of wolves and the extreme isolation of Isle Royal were major factors in predicting the outcomes um, of what happened there. And so what I find really exciting about all of this is how inherently integrative it is and how it um, sort of bridges these major themes in ecology, evolution, and conservation. And so a lot of the work in my lab is motivated by the goal of increasing understanding of each one of these components in order to better predict the outcomes of genetic rescue and to broaden its use as a management tool. <clears throat> my talk today is in three parts. So I'm going to first highlight some of the experimental work we have using model systems, and then I'll transition to um, work, our work on species of conservation concern. So for decades, there's been this classic view of homogenize, the homogenizing evolutionary role of gene flow. The way that gene flow is often considered is depicted by this inverse relationship between the level of gene flow and the amount of adaptive differentiation between populations in distinct environments. And this constraining role of gene flow has received strong theoretical support in the context of migration load and migration selection balance. And this inverse relationship has been documented in many well-known empirical systems, which all kind of lead to this classic dominant view that gene flow primarily homogenizes and limits local adaptation. But this classic view tends to be based on these systems that have medium to large population sizes. They occupy pretty stable environments. They've often been exchanging migrants for many generations, and so they can be considered more or less in equilibrium condi conditions. And what I'm really interested in is the fact that gene flow could play this entirely different evolutionary and ecological role in natural populations today, many of which are small, recently isolated, increasingly stressed, and in danger of going extinct. So to address this question, I've uh, leveraged live bearing fish in the Pisaleid family, so guppies and mosquito fish, as model systems to carry out gene flow manipulation experiments. And the first study I want to highlight uh, took advantage of a translocation experiment that was carried out in Trinidad, where I studied the effects of new gene flow from um, an adaptively differentiated source population from this downstream headwater, sorry, downstream main stem site into these two headwater streams that were located upstream from these two 
focal populations of guppies that are presumably locally adapted to this headwater environment. So I carried out a long-term monthly market capture and genetic monitoring study of these two focal populations where we uniquely mar marked close to 10,000 individual guppies across those two populations for three months prior to these translocations and then for about two years after the onset of gene flow. The most immediate outcome we observed were these really dramatic increases in population size in both streams <clears throat> following the onset of gene flow. So these two populations started out under 100 individuals each, and by the end of the study were nearly 10 times as large. And this pattern looks kind of similar to what I showed you of these previous studies of genetic rescue. So this demographic expansion following the onset of gene flow, but we really wanted to understand what are the underlying dynamics sort of leading to these demographic expansions. Was this due to just a large influx of new immigrant guppies coming into our sites that happened to be some really good environmental years for guppies where just sort of the environment led to population growth? Or was this an example of genetic rescue. To study this in better detail, we genotyped every individual caught within the time frame outlined in that gray box there. So this was just over 3,000 guppies and assigned every individual a continuous hybrid index ranging between zero, which reflects the pure uh, resident genotype in blue here, and one, which is the pure immigrant genotype. And so anything between zero and one is classified as a hybrid. Um, so, for example, F1 hybrids would be assigned a hybrid index of 0.5. And what this figure shows is this introduction and spread of the immigrant and hybrid genotypes over time. So the y-axis here is essentially population size. And you can see this introduction and, and spread of the, the immigrant and hybrid genotypes giving rise to these populations made up mostly of hybrids by the end of this time frame. I then used the continuously assigned hybrid index to test for a relationship between hybrid index on these X axes and the two major components of fitness, longevity, which we estimated from our long-term mark recapture data and lifetime reproductive success estimated from reconstructed wild pedigrees for these two populations. And I found that in all cases, both fit fitness metrics in both populations vary quadra varied quadratically with hybrid index and peak at these intermediate hybrid indices. So we did find a sex effect for longevity where female guppies are living longer than males. We did not observe a sex effect for reproductive success. But the key takeaway here is that these quadratic models outperformed linear models and peak at these intermediate hybrid indices, indicating that it's these hybrids that are outperforming the pure resident genotype, as well as the individuals coming down from that translocation source population. And so what this means is that these large increases in population size that we observed were caused by high hybrid fitness, indicating genetic rescue. And the study was one of the, I think, first and most detailed description of these underlying fitness dynamics leading to genetic rescue and replicated in, in two wild populations. Okay, the next question we had was whether all of this gene flow that we observed swamped local adaptation as theory would predict. And so we addressed this question using a RADSeq data set uh, from populations sampled before gene flow and then about eight guppy generations after gene flow. So this PCA plot is based on about 12,000 SNPs and indicates that pre-gene flow, these two sites are very highly differentiated from each other and from this downstream source site in red. But these same sites sampled a handful of guppy generations after all this gene flow are now almost indistinguishable from each other or from the downstream source site. So signature of this overall genomic homogenization following gene flow. And so we wanted to know the extent to which all of this gene flow has also swamped locally adaptive variation. To do this, uh, an approach was developed in collaboration with Gideon Bradbird, who's now at University of Michigan. Um, and what we did is first identify this set of candidate adaptive loci in these populations. So these were loci that had 
very low differentiation between the two pre-gene flow headwater populations, so presumably contributing to adaptation to that headwater environment, and had very high differentiation between headwater and downstream sites. We identified 146 of these putative adaptive loci. And then we estimated the extent to which those candidate adaptive loci resisted integration based on genome-wide expect expectations. And so these are all 146 of these candidate adaptive loci and their initial allele frequencies for Kaiwal, one of our populations. And the only thing to take away from this figure is to look at all these blue arrows here. So the blue arrows um, indicate the deviation between observed and expected allele frequencies colored in the direction in which they deviate. And so anything with a blue arrow is a candidate adaptive loci that's um, resisted integration based on what we'd expect based on sort of genome-wide rates of integration. And in fact, we did find this excess of pre-gene flow headwater ancestry at the set of candidate adaptive loci in the post-gene flow populations which is shown by the purple distributions here. So the signature is consistent with selection having maintained some of this locally important, locally adaptive variation that was present in the pre-gene flow populations despite mm -hmm. genome-wide homogenization. And we were very excited by these results because contrary to the traditional view that gene flow constrains local adaptation, we showed that gene flow from this adaptively differentiated source population can produce long-term individual and population fitness benefits in these small isolated populations without entirely swamping the locally adaptive variation. We found that these benefits persisted pretty long-term, so over eight to 10 generations, and were more or less replicated in these two wild populations. So ultimately, this body of work that has been based on these gene flow manipulation experiments in wild populations in the lab, more like common garden settings, and in mesocosm populations, I think has expanded the field's understanding of the role of gene flow under the conditions that many natural populations face today. Um, it's often assumed that the primary genetic mechanism leading to genetic rescue is um, alleviation of inbreeding depression. But I think an additional possibility that's received less attention is that this variation provided by gene flow might also increase short-term stress tolerance and facilitate faster adaptive evolution, uh, both of which are increasingly necessary as populations are exposed to these stressful and changing environments. And so this is a direction um, I'm currently pursuing. We've explored some short-term stress tolerance experiments with guppies and other fish. So here we showed that guppy populations with a previous history of gene flow, so from these two genetic rescue sites in black here, had higher thermal tolerance than three very close neighboring populations in really similar environments, but without a recent history of gene flow. In a mesocosm experiment, we found that guppy populations with the recent history of gene flow shown here in the, the light blue and purple had faster individual growth rates when exposed to a novel environment compared to populations without this recent history of gene flow in red. And we found similar patterns in a totally distantly related fish species. So this uh, work was carried out by Dan Oliveira, who's now a PhD student here at Berkeley. Uh, Dan was a previous RU student in my lab at KBS. And he showed that local rainbow darter populations um, around where we're based in Michigan that harbored more genome-wide heterozygosity were also better at tolerating acute heat stress. So we're exploring these patterns now in much greater mechanistic detail in a project that was funded through NSF's Bridging Ecology and Evolution Track. Um, so this is a project that I'm leading along with my postdoc, Jessica Judson, in collaboration with Betsy Rothermel at Archbold Biological Station, and again with Gideon Bradbird. And um, for this project, we've generated these experimental mesocosm populations that vary in their recent evolutionary history by manipulating genetic drift and gene flow. So these are hypothetical data that we're in the process of, of, of confirming. 
but in theory, each of these populations has started out with the same level of heterozygosity that came from the same initial source population. We then manipulated drift by doing these serial bottlenecks in, in many of the tanks. Half of those drifted populations then received a pulse of gene flow. So that's the gene flow treatment. And then we have one really large population that's remained large and same sort of original standing levels of variation um, as, as the start. And so we have these three different evolutionary um, backgrounds. And last month, fish from these three different backgrounds were used to seed a large mesocosm experiment in which we'll heat some of these tanks to near lethal temperatures for mosquito fish and ask, to what extent does this new variation provided by gene flow actually facilitate faster adaptation and reduce extinction risk when exposed to this novel stress? And what are the underlying genomic mechanisms? So a time series of whole genomes throughout this experiment um, will, in theory, uh, uncover how the genomic um, patterns underlying these observed population outcomes in each of these populations. Okay. So I'm, I'm very excited about what we're learning from the experimental work, um, but the other really urgent focus of my lab's research is to inform the design implementation and monitoring of genetic rescue in imperiled species. Um, throughout the last decade, I think we've learned a lot more and really improved our ability to uh, predict genetic rescue, thanks to experiments from model systems, some of which I just mentioned. Um, but although there's this handful of sort of iconic examples of genetic rescue used in conservation that everyone's heard of, the Florida panthers, the prairie chickens, it's still generally not a widely used strategy in management. And this is despite many outspoken calls for changing how we think about the genetic management of fragmented populations. So I led an effort along with uh, members of my lab to explore how underused this strategy really is by surveying the Fish and Wildlife Service recovery plan documentation for uh, 222 vertebrate species listed as threatened or endangered in the US. Um, we came up with this genetic rescue suitability index that balances risks associated with inbreeding versus outbreeding depression. And we found that 65% of these listed vertebrate species were in fact good candidates for consideration based on this index, meaning that they would likely benefit from some amount of restored connectivity, assisted migration, or genetic rescue. Um, we found that these good candidate species span all vertebrate taxonomic groups and all geographic regions. And we were surprised to find that only 11 recovery plans ever explicitly mentioned genetic rescue and only three out of the 222 have officially implemented translocations with the expressed purpose of genetic rescue. <clears throat> so given the potential promise of this strategy, why have there been so few attempts? Um, I think there are some intuitive reasons for this. It's often a very costly and logistically challenging strategy um, to the point where it just might not be possible for some species. But I think the biggest limitation is that there's still so many of these uncertainties and possible risks involved with each of these parts of the process here. Um, and the fact that predicting fitness effects of gene flow has been so notoriously difficult in the past. So moving from model systems to real world conservation scenarios, uh, these are all species we're currently working on in my lab. Um, they're all either federally or state threatened or endangered. Um, they're found restricted to highly fragmented landscapes, often found in small isolated populations, and they've declined or been extirpated from large portions of their former range. Um, and of course, each of these species also has its own unique decline history and conservation needs. And so I think one of the key aspects that um, of this work that has been really fun to do is, is to work really closely with the managers to listen to their needs and to develop and execute the respective research priorities for each species. Um, so this is, to me, one of the most exciting aspects of this work is that there is no like one size fits all solution for how to do this in the real world. Um, 
And it takes these collaborative teams and creative people and passionate people to kind of come up with uh, each one of these unique problems, solutions to the problems. So we're in the um, sort of furthest along on this work with this Arkansas darter. So I'm going to zoom in here first. The Arkansas darter is a stream fish with a patchy distribution ranging from Colorado to Arkansas. It receives state level protection in every state in which it's found and was previously a candidate for federal listing. Uh, this fish is restricted to wetted sections of small streams in the Great Plains that are becoming increasingly intermittent due to groundwater removal and climate warming. And we showed in a previous study that stream intermittency is associated with uh, increased genetic isolation among populations in Colorado. And actually yesterday, my flight went right over Arkansas darter territory in Kansas. And I looked down and um, I, it was very cool to me. I'd never seen this aerial perspective of these streams where I'm sure Arkansas darters are found and kind of paints this picture of how precarious these small streams are amidst this drying landscape. Um, so after my work on this species in Colorado, state managers were interested in how the species was doing sort of range-wide, and so they carried out this extensive field sampling effort of 241 sites throughout the entire range of the species, and the aims of the study were to try to merge landscape genomic approaches with an evaluation of inbreeding and outbreeding risks throughout the range of the species in order to directly inform management decisions. And so specifically, we set out to identify landscape features contributing to genetic isolation, but also to identify possible drainages and populations to prioritize as ones uh, to target for assisted migration, as well as ones to use as donors for that strategy with the goal of informing management. Um, so Brendan Reed, a previous postdoc in my lab, led this work in which we first developed a reference genome for the species. We collected whole genome sequences on a small subset of individuals throughout the range. And then Brendan collected a really high quality uh, reduced representation genomic data set. So a RADseq plus capture approach on the full sample size. Uh, so first looking at overall patterns of population structure, this is the best supported admixture plot and mapped ancestry proportions on each of the sample sites. And we see that population structure tended to reflect the sort of drainage level clustering as would be expected for a small stream associated fish. Uh, the landscape genomic analyses revealed that stream distance, stream intermittency, crop cover, and dams all uh, were positively associated with genetic isolation. And quick point here to say that I think uh, these results are really useful to the managers because it helps them identify and understand what landscape features might be able to be targeted to improve natural connectivity among these populations. So ultimately the goal is natural connectivity, not us moving things around. Um, and this gives them a chance to know kind of what to target. So they can't change stream distance, but they may be able to go in and remove small dams and culverts in order to increase chances for um, natural connectivity among these sites. The next step was to use multiple lines of evidence from the genomic data sets to identify populations that would likely stand to benefit from assisted migration. So ones that are experiencing the worst sort of small population problems, those with lowest levels of genetic variation, highest inbreeding, smallest effective population sizes, things like that. And so I'm just gonna highlight just a few examples here. Um, so on this map, the colors correspond to um, the population structure results, so distinct genetic themes, but now the circles are scaled to the average level of individual heterozygosity at a given site. And note these tiny circles that you can barely see out here in Colorado, which indicated to our partners at Colorado Parks and Wildlife a sort of statewide concern about uh, the level of genetic drift in these populations. Um, for the Kansas managers, this allows them to sort of better focus their efforts on certain drainages or certain populations within drainages that seem to be relatively worse off. So help them prioritize. Looking closely at patterns of isolation by distance revealed some major barriers to connectivity. 
Uh, so this is the Nineska River in south central Kansas, where many of our darter sites are located in small tributaries upstream of a large reservoir, the Cheney Reservoir. Um, so there's likely very little opportunity now for connecti natural connectivity to occur among these sites upstream from the reservoir. Um, and in fact, um, we see higher levels of genetic isolation at shorter distances in these populations and uh, between populations among populations in red that are located upstream from the reservoir compared to the sites sampled downstream from the reservoir. So higher genetic isolation among these sites, indicating it's restoring connectivity through a human assisted migration is likely going to be really important for these sites uh, to maintain variation and, and ensure the sort of long term persistence. Did, did the fish not live in the reservoir? Is that they no, they don't do well in the reservoir. Yeah, they're very st small stream associated fish. So now that we've identified some recipient populations to target, the same data sets then can be used to screen for ideal populations or even ideal donor individuals um, to use as, as donors for this type of strategy. So ones that would decrease the chances for outbreeding depression if you use them as a gene flow source. We know, for example, that structural variation, things like inversions or insertions or deletions can increase the potential for outbreeding depression. Um, so let's say we've identified one of these tiny Colorado populations to target for assisted migration. Here we use uh, our whole genome data to identify the number of indels or insertions, deletions, structural variants relative to one of these um, Colorado sites. So each dot is an individual here colored by the drainage in which it's found. And we see this generally linear relationship between the amount of genetic distance relative to that Colorado reference. Um, but as you increase genetic distance, these populations accumulate more structural variation as expected. However, here are these two individuals from the same drainage, but this one here has about half the number of indels relative to, um, to the Colorado reference. And so this would be the much less risky option to use in a assisted migration strategy. And I think the level of this level of precision in guiding these decisions is really not something that was possible a decade ago. Um, it's really only recently that it's become feasible to collect whole genomes at a population scale in non-model organisms, which I think is needed for some of these risk assessments. And after collecting these data, we were able to sit down with our partners and say, these are the populations that, these are the sites that we think need to be prioritized, here's why, and these are our suggestions for the best potential donors. And I think it's these specific recommendations that, um, that really hit home and incentivize action for these managers. It's not some theoretical flow chart, it's these are the sites that they know that they've been to and we're trying to empower them with, with this information to do something that will likely help. And the last point to make here is that there's a major advantage of thinking about this at an earlier stage before waiting until many of these populations have blinked out. Um, so you're much more likely to have options that will lead to successful genetic rescue. You're not stuck with the only option being a really risky one to use. Okay. I really uh, wanna briefly highlight this, um, some ongoing work we have on these two imperiled species in Michigan. Uh, so this Mitchell Sater butterfly is one of the rarest butterflies in North America. It has this interesting disjunct range where um, there's a handful of declining populations in Michigan, very isolated small populations, and then a set, a set of uh, larger, more connected populations down in Mississippi and Alabama. Um, so along with Cinnamon Matan, a um, NSF postdoc in my lab, and Nick Haddad, we are, um, developing genomic resources for this butterfly. So we're developing a reference genome for the species. We'll characterize range-wide landscape genomic patterns as we did with the darters. And then Cinnamon will also be carrying out a, a set of a uh, small number of controlled crosses between the Michigan and Alabama butterflies to test the feasibility of potentially infusing some of these Northern populations that are really struggling in Michigan with butterflies from the South. And importantly, the 
goals for this project were sort of identified, stemmed from priorities identified by the Mitchell Sater Working Group and will directly inform management actions taken for the species. In a project led by Megan Clark, a PhD student in my lab, in collaboration with Jen Moore at Grand Valley State University and Eric Heilman at Mississippi State, we're leveraging these two awesome uh, long-term marker capture data sets on federally endangered Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes collected by Jen and Eric. Um, so Megan has collected genomic data for over a thousand snakes and is using that to reconstruct wild pedigrees for these two populations and to test for signs of inbreeding depression, which we'll then use to inform managers whether assisted migration is appropriate or makes sense in the species like the Massasauga that's found in these naturally fragmented environments like prairie fens in Michigan. And so, yeah, just to sort of summarize this section, um, I think one of our main goals for developing the suitability index and writing this paper was to help move forward the discussion um, beyond just sort of the call for, hey, let's use genetic rescue um, into thinking about how to uh, actually operationalize this in the real world. And so I'm yeah, hopeful that our applied work on these systems is helping sort of pave the way forward in, in this respect. Okay, I've got my eye on the clock here, but I think um, I'm really excited to share this last vignette um, because I think it kind of pulls together many of the components uh, that I've been talking about to study the effects of translocations and gene flow in action in a fast declining species, uh, the Florida scrub jay. So the Florida scrub jay is one of North America's rarest and, and most rapidly declining, declining bird species. It was federally listed as threatened in 1987 and a, a combination of cooperative breeding, um, restricted dispersal and really extreme habitat specialization to this unique Florida scrub habitat uh, makes the species especially vulnerable. So over the past century, this Florida scrub habitat has been reduced to less than 10% of its historical range due to land conversion and fire suppression. And so Florida scrub jays now exist really precariously in just a few dozen isolated populations, many of which are small, declining, and vulnerable to extirpation. Scrub jays along the coast have been especially hard hit. Um, to the point where entire genetic units and meta populations have been lost. Work by Nancy Chen has and her colleagues have shown that even in one of the largest, uh, most in theory stable populations in central Florida, a reduction in immigration into that population over the last few decades has increased inbreeding and signs of inbreeding depression are, are apparent in this population, which is sort of considered as one of the strong, presumed strongholds for the species. So given this, um, the updated Fish and Wildlife Service recovery plan for the Florida scrub jay now calls for actions to restore connectivity, such as translocations, population augmentations, and genetic rescue. And in fact, this was one of those 11 recovery, uh, recovery plans in the survey that did actually explicitly mention genetic rescue. Um, so I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to be involved with two of the earliest translocation uh, implementations of translocations in Florida scrub jays, uh, one that started in the early 2000s, way before I was involved, and one um, on the Atlantic coast of Florida that I've been, help, uh, been able to help lead and design. We'll first zoom into the Gulf Coast here, where this phosphate mining company called Mosaic Fertilizer owned and was planning to mine several parcels of land occupied by Florida scrub jays within a meta population that was facing high extinction risk. So in order to preserve these scrub jay lineages that would otherwise be lost, uh, Mosaic decided to translate, translocate jays from these isolated sites into uh, this recipient site um, called the Mosaic well field that was adjacent to a public preserve with, a, with a, yeah, shown here in brown. So the motivation for these translocations was both to preserve these genetic lineages that may have otherwise been lost through the mining activities, but also I think with the foresight that maybe bringing these jays together um, from these isolated subpopulations into an area where there is habitat 
available uh, might induce a genetic rescue effect and, and be really good for the whole metapopulation as a whole. From 2003 to 2010, a total of 51 Js were translocated uh, from these various sites into the Mosaic Wellfield site. And then we got the opportunity 20 years later to study the consequences of these translocations. And thanks to really intensive demographic monitoring at the Wellfield site, an immediate and seemingly sustained demographic expansion was observed following the translocations indicated by the pink arrows here. So the population grew from 16 individuals at this Wellfield site to 130, and the number of scrub jay family groups grew from four to 44. This should look familiar to you by now, and maybe you can anticipate what I'm about to say, which is, okay, this looks very promising, but let's see what the underlying dynamics are that are driving this demographic expansion. So Mosaic brought us on last year, and Tyler Linderoth, a bioinformatician in my lab, um, has led these analyses. Our data set consists of whole genome sequences from 86 Js, um, the set of resident birds that existed at the Wellfield site prior to translocations in dark blue here, um, a set of um, all families in the contemporary population were represented in our um, whole genome data set indicated uh, shown in the pink here. We have 29 of the translocated Js and um, a handful of Js that were sort of opportunistically sampled at a wider spatial scale, scale throughout this metapopulation. The first figure Tyler showed me yeah, was this uh, PCA plot. And given that we were both a little concerned going into this, that the time frame we were studying might be too fast to see much change at all, uh, we saw this and both thought, this is cool. Um, you can see the substantial genetic shift that's occurred in the Wellfield site, where the resident population, these dark blue Rs, is now sort of nested within this larger, sort of more expansive contemporary population with the pink Cs. And this, you can see this contemporary population kind of being uh, diffusing outwards towards some of the other sites, including some of the translocated sites. Digging into this a little deeper, we then estimated variation in genetic contribution to the contemporary population with this genetic skew parameter. Um, so these are all the non-contemporary scrub jays lined up in order of how much of their genetic ancestry has contributed to the contemporary population at the well field. And the really striking thing to note here is this highly skewed pattern uh, where it's a handful of Js contributing heavily to this contemporary population. And then this sort of flattens out to the extent that most individuals are contributing very little or nothing at all. And this is mirrored in the PCA where you can see this contemporary population now being sort of pulled in the direction in, in particular towards these three individual Js that are, have contributed the most to the uh, contemporary population. So these three lineages with, that, with the highest genetic skew. <clears throat> so hypothetically, an ideal genetic rescue uh, would lead to increased heterozygosity as gene flow infuses this new genetic variation and provides more opportunity for mixing. Um, and this should decrease inbreeding in the contemporary population. However, we are now seeing the opposite pattern. So we see that heterozygosity has significantly decreased in the contemporary population relative to the site prior to the translocations and relative to the rest of the metapopulation. And we see this corresponding increase in inbreeding. Presumably because of this high genetic skew where only a few individuals are the ones contributing substantially to the contemporary population. Um, so I think this is really important to know, although the translocations have led to this successful demographic expansion, looking under this hood in more detail uh, using genomic tools reveals a more worrisome picture about what's going on here and suggests that further management will be needed to mitigate these increases in inbreeding. And importantly, we would not have detected this 
if we were just doing demographic surveys alone. So for example, looking at a common metric of demographic success, total fledged offspring um, shows that this often does predict these individuals with highest genetic skew, but there are many cases in which it doesn't. So there are many individuals that have been successful at producing fledging offspring, but those families really haven't contributed beyond that um, to this contemporary population. And another point I wanna make here is about how these translocations were carried out with 51 Js being introduced into a recipient population of 16 is probably not what I would recommend to a manager uh, for designing like ideally what you'd wanna see. Um, in this case, they had no choice and, and we've learned a lot I think from this scenario. It's been really interesting to study these outcomes of what happens when you sort of overwhelm this, um, this recipient population. But I think in looking forward, we can use what we've learned from this mosaic study, as well as from 20 years of people thinking about the smartest way to implement genetic rescue and take a much more cautious and informed approach. And this is um, exactly what we're trying to do at Jonathan Dickinson State Park on the Atlantic coast. So this park encompasses about 10,000 acres of protected uh, habitat, much of which is Florida scrub in really good shape. And what I mean by that is the park biologist there is amazing and he does the sort of burns at the regular intervals, uh, works on thinning invasive species. So really good quality, large chunks of good quality scrub habitat. Um, the park hosts a population of, of jays that's been reduced to between 40 and 80 individuals down from a population that was over 300 in the 1990s. And so a key point here is that this habitat is available and it's in good condition, but that population is not expanding into it. So suggesting these sort of intrinsic factors like inbreeding depression might be limiting the population growth at this site. And so we put together this really exciting team of scrub jay biologists, uh, state wildlife managers, and conservation genomicists with the goal of putting together as many pieces of understanding as possible um, to carry out a really highly informed assisted migration for strategy for eventual genetic rescue of this population. Well, we started by gaining a very uh, exhaustive genomic and demographic characterization of the recipient population at JD. Um, so this is Natasha Lear in my lab. She's our heroic field leader doing full demographic characterization of this entire population at the park. So she tracks each family group, knows where all their territories are. Um, all birds are uniquely banded and bled for the genomic sample. Um, during the breeding season, she locates and monitors each nest and tracks status of hatchlings, fledglings, and juveniles. And Natasha fully censuses the whole population every month. Um, and just a note that this sort of level of really devoted boots on the ground field work provides us with that super detailed individual and population fitness data, um, which is a major component of being able to look under the hood and understand what's driving observed changes in population dynamics. Tram Nien is a PhD student at Cornell University who's the fearless leader on the genomic side. Um, so TRAM has collected really high quality whole genome sequences for nearly every known breeder at this population, as well, as well as having characterized a few other populations of interest, specifically this site that we've identified as the site to use as a source population for translocations. What TRAM has confirmed is that we do see this elevated level of inbreeding at Jonathan Dickinson relative to the source site, and just in general, these levels of individual inbreeding are like scary high and yeah, just alarmingly high levels of inbreeding at this site. And what's really exciting is that now after four years of this sort of tireless demographic data collection, we're starting to be able to merge these data sets and explore patterns of inbreeding depression, which we see a slight signature of here. Um, so this is merging trans genomic data with Natasha's demographic uh, information. Um, and we see that individuals with higher inbreeding tend to produce fewer fledglings. Um, yeah. In 2019, in collaboration with uh, Carl Miller, Richard here from the uh, Florida 
Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, we initiated the first translocations into this park. So we introduced a single family in the first year in 2019, and then two families of Jays in 2020, uh, for a total of eight Jays into a resident population of about 80. And this was deliberate trying to shoot for this sort of 10% um, mark. These translocations have been successful so far. So six of the eight birds um, are still alive and we've observed breeding activity in all translocated individuals, as well as the presence of two translocated resident mixed pairs. Um, one of those pairs has produced, so, so successfully produced uh, offspring. And just quickly returning to TRAMS data here, um, these are the inbreeding coefficients of the translocated individuals themselves as well as this reduced level of inbreeding in the F1 hybrid as we'd expect. Um, so yeah, our plan is to continue to track the outcomes of these translocations in great detail to make adjustments if needed, and hopefully to ensure the growth and long-term recovery of this population. Right, so... Um, Ultimately, through my work on these applied systems, as well as our experimental evolution work and the scrub jays, where we're kind of trying to do both, um, the goal is to keep advancing understanding of each one of these components, uh, to keep paving the way for the field, and to um, empower managers with the tools for implementing successful long-term genetic rescue uh, for the many species currently hovering on the brink. Uh, I really want to thank funding sources and partnerships that have made this work possible, uh, working with these partners, especially many of the um, park biologists and wildlife managers has been a, a really rewarding aspect of, of the applied work. And I uh, really appreciate you all for listening and uh, happy to take questions. Somebody could hit the lights in the back. We have time for a few questions. I'll let you call on people. Okay. Yeah, Fred. Yeah, awesome talk. Thanks. Thanks. Um, with the Trinidadian guppies, where they have this like really well characterized differences in phenotypes mm -hmm. with the local adaptation, mm -hmm. have you also looked at whether those have become more similar over time with all this? Input? Yeah, I've had to whittle the guppy work down to. Uh, yes, we have looked at um, many different phenotypes and it's pretty idiosyncratic. So many like male color actually increase in the in the direction you'd expect, which is kind of interesting. So maybe some of this variation plus strong selection is actually like increasing traits in the direction they should go. Um, many uh, like life history traits have remained what you'd expect, but then there's some other, you know, like uh, yeah, it's sort of a trait by trait story, but in many cases, we do find that the phenotypes that we'd expect have either stayed the way they should or gotten even like stronger in that direction. That was great. Um, I wonder if sample selection is complex in sample selection might be going on hmm. as well swapping effect that you saw in the next day. So uh-huh. Huh. Um, like selection for a novel behavior, like novel individual. Yeah, I was thinking if it was um, males, it could be mm -hmm. you know, some kind of female choice rather than that or mm -hmm. male. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one question. Mm -hmm. And then another question was sort of um, about the heterozygosity itself, mm -hmm. the degree to which um, if you can assess it, and I won't say this carefully, um, whether over dominance itself mm -hmm. is giving you a signature of enhanced fitness, or if it's sort of a more general yeah. kind of balancing selection for the group. Yes. Um, so, first question, I think we're now getting we're trying to sort of unpack what are the features of these successful translocated birds that are leading it was it we first looked at like 
maybe because there was sort of this timeline of translocation so was it the first batch of jays that there's just like a priority effect where they got there first and established their territories and that's why that doesn't seem to be the case interestingly i thought that was kind of the most obvious explanation um so yeah choice or just digging into the i mean the social dynamics of these jays is so fascinating and complex that yeah i think um that's going to be a really fun area to like really pick apart um i wish i knew the answer to your second question that's like life goal of mine is to know does over dominance exist i think it does but i don't know if it does but um yeah we're trying to look at that i think in like more detail in the scambusia experiment to see what what's going on is it genome wide increases in heterozygosity is it uh yeah certain like this population got lucky they got a certain combination of alleles that led to evolved heat tolerance um trying to pick that apart is a major goal of that that mosquito fish work and so i'll get back to you <laughs> i don't know do you think over dominance exists <laughs> Good, we're on the same team then. Uh, yeah, awesome talk, Sarah. This was a cool project. Thank, thank you. Um, I guess I was, and I may have a lot of reviews on this too. I was wondering if you have a clear criteria for when you try to locate, or do you think it's mm. specific? Mm. I mean, are you worried about? Like the devil's little puffish, right? There's mm -hmm. Translocation, and then suddenly seventy percent of the genome is gone. It's mm -hmm. with the invader. So how, mm -hmm. how do you, when when do we know? Do you, right. I mean, indels, right? Do you think we should be looking for indels every time? But... Right. I yeah. So it quickly becomes a philosophical discussion. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think part of my point is that like, yeah, when you have the opportunity to look for in to, to inform these decisions with like the tools that we are now equipped with i think we can be like there is that review from early 2000s about the multifarious fitness effects of gene flow and i think if we understand the right components of the natural history of the organism and the genomics of the recipient and donor like we can actually be pretty good at predicting fitness effects of gene flow like i think it, it is actually predictable when you have all the pieces in place in a conservation context, you often don't have all those pieces in place, but I think maybe um, maybe the generalizations to be drawn for the managers is like, these are sort of the priorities of goals you should try to understand first before deciding, I don't know. Um, I think in some cases we won't have time to wait until the reference genome is developed and everything is sequenced and in many this is happening, you know, across the world, right? So in the U.S., we might have like more recess resources and fish and wild, like Endangered Species Act, to fund this work. But that's not going to be true everywhere. And so you still, I think, rambling now. But I do think that there's this accumulated evidence that unless there's some obvious, they breed in totally different times of year, or they're like you know, the famous examples of outbreeding depression are pretty extreme. And so I think we can like lean a little bit more on the side of let's try it if that population is going to go extinct anyway, I guess. That's where I fall on that. Yeah, yeah I have a sort of general question about conservation. Um, and that's whether you see this as a short term solution. Yeah. Or to what extent is it is it really a solution in the sense of yeah. if most of the problem is habitat destruction? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about this with the the darters. If, mm -hmm. if if the streams are really no longer connected and you manage to rescue one population, yeah. how long is that going to help? And yeah, what can you talk about that bigger context? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and I do think that this is sort of a stop gap stop gap measure to buy time for populations when the ultimate goal is like restore the habitat restore the natural patterns of connectivity um but i do think yeah that buying time can be really important in the case of like these small populations that are so vulnerable to a disturbance coming in and wiping out the whole thing like if you can get that um sort of demographic boost and also infuse some alleles that might help them evolve faster if 
there's time to do so um that that is a good thing and going to be important in many cases and then another point is i think you know and depending on the sort of spatial configuration of these species which is always going to be species specific to some extent um like one of the goals with the mosaic project was to create sort of um that the meta population was deemed as one with like very high risk of going extinct because it had gone from like this core with subpopulations into just small isolated populations and so if by doing this you can create more of a core for a meta population to then be able to like increase dispersal and increase persistence of the whole meta population that's sort of like a longer term benefit i think for the species that's more than just this you know stop gap measure i guess Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if there's any potential for like the upstream population to maybe have been adapted to like producing higher quality offspring mm -hmm. to yield them. Mm -hmm. You bring in these others, you get the population but that might actually be That's a great point. And yeah, looking into the nuances of the guppy system, that's exactly what happened in terms of like, you know, this is Resnick's whole life history differences and the ones that were introduced were the high fecundity fast uh, life history phenotypes so that did likely contribute to this sort of yeah boom in the recipient populations but I think what's interesting David told me that his fish were going to win out um because of this phenomenon but it's not actually that they were like entirely swamped there is this like maintenance of locally adapted phenotypes and some locally important variation that existed prior to that so yes and no <laughs> <laughs> were the upstream guppy populations declining um i wish i knew that yeah we only got there right before the translocations happened so we had three months of monitoring and they were very small populations, but in part it was the end of the wet season. And so that's when all guppy populations are pretty small. Um, I will say that they were incredibly like compared to many other populations in similar environments, these had very extremely low levels of genetic variation and weird phenotypic anomalies. Like I think they were like on the pretty far extreme end of highly drifted and possibly inbred i don't know if they were in decline but some of these small stream guppy sites do blink in and out um yeah making them kind of good proxies i guess for for these type of questions all right well if there are no more questions thanks for a wonderful talk oh you're welcome thank you